Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma, the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And welcome back for yet another episode. We're officially into double digits now. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, you know, a lot of podcasts end up shutting down long before they get this far. So uh, we're fairly proud of ourselves for sticking to it. Um, and we're really thankful to all of you for coming back and listening every week. Um, now that we're at this stage, um, we feel like it's it's about time for us to rip off a very uh, dear friend of ours, uh, you know, Sagar and Marshall at the Realignment and start uh, creating a scheme for you guys to review and rate the podcast. So here's the way it's going to work. If you rate us five stars and put a review on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, and ask a question in there, we promise we will answer it at the intro segment uh, of this podcast every week. Okay, we we may not answer every single one. Yeah, don't ask anything uh, degenerate, we, please. We, we promise we will pick at least one, maybe more, a week. Like that, I, I am willing to make a much more grandiose promise than Nick is, <laughs> um, uh, provided it is safe for work. This is a family podcast. Uh, we will answer your question, and uh, and uh, if you don't feel like putting it in the review, feel free to email us the screenshot of you rating the podcast five stars at podcast at americanmoment dot org, and send in suggestions, feedback, or anything else you have at that as well. You always offer that, but but that email address goes to me. I so if I get any critical feedback, it comes to me, not mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm very excited for you to have to <laughs> deal with that critical feedback. Nick is right. more than more than happy to to answer any emails you have. So please feel free to to send him something. Um, but uh, if you go to AmericanMoment.org right now, you can also sign up for Summit, a conference on American statecraft. Still, just the interest form. We are nailing down the final details, and hopefully, in the next couple weeks, here we'll have a full application live for a wonderful conference in the fall that we are putting together that will fulsome, fulsomely and forthrightly advocate the agenda that we believe in, that we've outlined in our priorities, and that so many of the guests on this podcast are fighting for every day. Um, once again, Nick, I ask you, can we tease anything about Summit yet? It's going to be fun. Uh, people people are going to enjoy it. Hey, there's going to be a lot of good food. Actually, I do know that. Uh, I have... I have I've been on a couple of food tastings uh, at a couple various venues, and I have to say it's all been pretty good. So there will be good food. I can promise at least that much. <laughs> it's going to be a fantastic conference. We're being coy about the details right now, but we highly recommend you check it out. Once again, that's on AmericanMoment.org, and you can find all the details there. Today, uh, our guest is in some ways a fellow traveler, uh, which is uh, immediately making me think of uh, how much of an imposter I am because this person is, is far more accomplished than Nick or I uh, are. We had on today Russ Vogt, uh, who is President Trump's Director of the Office of Management and Budget until the end of the administration. He is now the head of a new organization called the Center for Renewing America and Citizens for Renewing America, a nonprofit organization organization and a political uh, um, you know, engagement and activism organization, respectively. Uh, Russ is one of the leaders of, of these new organizations that are spinning up every day that we consider ourselves a part of that are thinking about the future of the America First agenda, how we continue the gains we made during the Trump administration, and how we avoid some of the mistakes that we made during the previous administration. We had a wide-ranging conversation on everything from what Center for Renewing America's charge is how Russ uh, has changed his approach and how he believes the conservative movement has changed its approach over the last couple of years, what it was like to work in the Trump administration and more. What did you think of that episode, Nick? Yeah, I think I think it was great. Uh, I think one of the things that strikes me about Russ is if you, you know, met up with him in a coffee shop or something, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that this guy like literally led a, a cabinet level department mm -hmm. um thing i really like the most humble people that i've ever met yeah like the thing i really like about russ and you know i i showed up about 10 minutes early to to record and it was the the first time that russ and i met before we recorded and we just sat down and talked like we just we just chatted uh and like russ has accomplished a lot of things but uh you know having this conversation with him which you know i hope you guys will will enjoy he's 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 a dude you know, like he 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 gets it uh, and he's coming at 
these issues and um, you know these policies from a you know a, a Christian and and also like kind of a communitarian perspective. Like he talks about community and family a lot uh, in this episode, which I you know particularly enjoy as a passion issue of mine. No, it was it was very um, uh, it was a lot of fun to to record with Russ and and really I I had no idea frankly that he was so well formed and and deeply believing on a lot of these issues so it was illustrative in that sense I highly recommend that you listen through to the end we we had a great conversation with Russ um, and we'll go to him now. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Ross. Thanks for having me. We always like to start with trying to, you know, tease out what people's story is and how they got to the uh, position they are in now. You're coming off of four years in the Trump administration. Why don't you walk our listeners through how you got involved in politics and, and what the path you took to the position of, of influence, I think, that you have now? Sure. Uh, I went to school at Wheaton College. I had to do a political internship. I came out here to D.C. really after I had walked with the, to get my diploma. And I did uh, some internships that really opened my eyes to the fact that these jobs existed, and I never left. Uh, my first job was working for Phil Graham, senator from Texas, and uh, was in his policy shop pretty early on. I went on to work uh, for a couple of House members and run the Republican Study Committee, uh, went into leadership, saw that perspective uh, when Mike Pence was in leadership. And then really after a number of years, I wanted to basically say, okay, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to explain to members how they should vote or recommend how they should vote. I want to take that uh, that knowledge and just give it to the movement and be able to give that straight to activists so that they can uh, be a force multiplier. At the time, Heritage Action was getting going, and I built the, the, the Sentinel program into making sure that there were you know, 17,000 activists who had that perspective and knew just as much of a, as a member of Congress uh, when it came to the policy, the process, and the politics of, a, of an issue. Uh, and then Donald Trump got elected, and I went uh, and was there on day one at OMB and was there for four years, um, ending up as the director. Now, OMB, uh, you know, us wonks know that's the Office of Management and Budget, but uh, what exactly does that agency do? Um, it's it feels like one of those things that that talking heads on cable just just mention. But I, I think a lot of our listeners could benefit from sort of understanding the details of what exactly the agency does, what value it provides to the White House and and to the federal government writ large. Sure, it's a cabinet level agency within the White House structure that does primarily three things. Number one, any fiscal decision, any budget decision goes through OMB. Um, it constructs the president's budget. Uh, every regulation goes through OMB for a cost benefit uh, assessment. Uh, and then finally, anything that's a whole of government execution, this is the, really the management uh, tag, anything that's whole of government uh, involving multiple uh, cabinet agencies, we would have a hand in making sure the president's prerogatives are being uh, championed through the bureaucracy. So something like the wall, uh, where you're dealing with trying to get Department of Defense to fund something for Department of Homeland Security is the perfect type of issue that we're going to work on. Or critical race theory, when the president says, I want to I want to not fund critical race theory through the federal government, that's involving all of the agencies. And we have to then make sure that the president's uh, agenda is executed. So when you got in uh, to the Office of Management and Budget, what was that like that first year? Uh, obviously, the president was an outsider, and um, it, there's been all sorts of ink spilled on how it, there was some some dis, uh, disunity and disorganization in those early days. Uh, a, uh, you came in at the at a deputy level, right? Initially, mm -hmm. um, what what were you seeing um, as one of the people who was who's right there in the thick of it in terms of how the early days of the administration went, and and what was the pushback you got from uh, and a recalcitrant agency that, like all of them, was resistant to any sort of conservative leader. Yeah, I came in as even as a senior advisor before um, I got nominated to be deputy. And so I was, uh, you know, there uh, staffing the OMB because Mick had not been confirmed yet. And so uh, I was really OMB's representative in all in all the meetings. I mean, I think that the early days were I viewed the wild, wild west, uh, you know, many different perspectives, uh, a lot of people in meetings. 
Um, if you thought you were going to talk about one issue, you were going to talk about 30 different other issues. I mean, it was it was uh, it was intense. Um, and yet uh, we were still accomplishing a lot of things. I mean, I think at that time, the real challenge was that the agency heads really believed in some respects that they got to run their their turf. And that's not the vision that the president had. And that's certainly not the vision the American people had. They, they elected Donald Trump. And so, you know, whether it was the State Department and, and Rex Tillerson saying we're going to keep high levels of foreign aid and, and us proposing, no, no, you're not. Uh, that was the type of discussion that, um, you know, had a lot more of uh, of, of attention around in a way that wasn't later on as the president got a lot more people who were more ideologically committed to his program. So can you walk us through like how things changed over time? Like after that first year where it's kind of like the wild, wild west. Um, we were talking about this a little bit before the show, but but walk us through um kind of how things changed over time, you know, as as, as staffing changed and as, uh, you know, the president's initiatives uh, became more uh, well-defined. Mm -hmm. Well, the president, in, and this is a theme for the entire administration, but we were all kind of putting our hands in the gloves of how to run these uh, agencies and in the president's perspective, all of them. And, you know, I think he was figuring out along the way uh, the type of staff that he wanted uh, the types of chief of staff that he wanted and how he was going to uh, make decisions. And, and he got a lot better over the over the course of time as he just learned more and, and knew more. Um, and I think, you know, uh, each chief brought a different, um, you know, improvement. Uh, John Kelly brought a process where we didn't really have much of one before, uh, which allows a lot of the business of government to do. And he certainly had his faults. Uh, and then when you get to Mick and Mark, they clearly had much more of the president's mind and let the president be the president. And uh, I think we saw that um, when we began to use PPO, that's the, the personnel office for, for those outside of D.C. to make sure that we were getting, you know, ideologically committed individuals up and down the agencies, uh, which is another thing. I mean, the agencies had generally thought, you know, we get to choose our people. Uh, that doesn't really work uh, because, you know, these are incredibly critical positions that the ability to execute is often on an individual's view of what is the art of the possible and ideolo ideolo ideology. And so you really need someone that's all in and can take risk and be smart about how much risk the president will want to take versus how much he, what, he won't. And can they get inside the mind of the president? Uh, and do they want to? And that and those that was a progression over time. And it was something I think at OMB we really brought to the table because we loved the president. Uh, we loved his agenda. And we were trying to figure out what he meant by something he said so that we can deliver on that and not just the, the letter of the law as to what he had said. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, too, is that, you know, for someone coming into D.C. from outside of politics and from outside of the... Uh, the bureaucracy. I mean, the president was really kind of thrown into a den of vipers, right? Of, of of people who, you know, have built a career off of you know selling out the American people and um, you know I guess imposing their will on policy. Um, you know, and and I guess like in retrospect, four years is a is a very quick time to have to learn uh, how to survive in a scenario like that. Um, one thing that I'm kind of curious to ask, you know, we've talked a little bit previously about, um, you know, Trump's term to, uh, you know, priorities. You've started an organization uh, to, you know, push some of those priorities. Can you kind of walk us through, you know, what those would have been, uh, you know, if Trump had had, uh, you know, continued to be president and then, you know, your new organization and what you're working on now? Sure. Uh, you know, I was talking to Nick earlier, we had a list of things that we would have accomplished in, in, in term two. Uh, and then there was the list of things that, you know, would be harder to accomplish in government that, you know, uh, if, if, if it was the unfortunate situation where we were not in office, we would, we, we, we would need further thinking on. And, and that's what we're now doing with the Center for Renewing America. But it's essentially to keep the fight going on America first issues. And I use the Afghanistan issue as a perfect example of why we think that there's a need for both policy development and uh, a network of, of 
America First activists to be brought into the the fight generation here in Washington D.C. The president did not have a plan to get him out outside of Afghanistan. He wanted to. He, that was his position. But in terms of okay, here are your generals, here are your diplomats, here's the plan X, Y, and Z. Uh, that took a number of years to develop. Why? Because the bureaucracy kept trying to kill it and take it back to him for another decision and bully him into a you know the position that they wanted. That's that's not how it should work. Um, and so there's a host of those issues about, you know, incredibly complicated issues, um, you know, big tech that uh, where we would we need additional insight and development on the outside to be able to do it. Your first part of your question, though, is what were we planning? Um, you know, we really were planning to be able to get a handle on the deficit and debt. Uh, we talked about it as our year five plan. That plan was um uh, being crafted and ready to go, even uh, not waiting into the new term. I mean, we would have had some things that were ready to go literally immediately through executive action uh, in terms of things that we could uh, change and reform. And, you know, we had the next round of uh, the DREG agenda, uh, which was, you know, we had done all the underbrush. We had done a lot of the things that were mentioned on the first campaign, but that was really just Obama level regulation. We were beginning to go back and figure out what what needs to happen from Clinton and Bush years, and and to to really uh, go, do peel the onion back even more, but again, figuring out by that time we knew how to run these agencies. Um, a lot of the deputies had had been promoted into the top job, and so uh, we were finding things that we could accomplish literally every day because we worked for a person that if you took a good idea to him, um, we would you know it would have been something that we could have executed on. Um, we would have probably taken on the independent agencies uh, from the regulatory perspective, which would have been a sea change uh, that was very much uh, in in the pipeline. When you talk about America first issues, um, I find that especially now after the president lost re-election, um, I always have to have a follow up conversation with someone when they mention that because I think it means different things to different people. Um, you know, I, I look back to the themes that the 2015 2016 campaign was run on things like restraining our foreign policy, immigration, trade as sort of the cornerstone of it. How do you, how do you define what America first issues look like um, and, and 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 what that what that even means to begin with? Sure. I mean, I think it, to zoom out a little bit and then I'll answer it directly is it's it's to remember that with every policy determination looking at it through the filter of what's good for this country and and maintaining the coherence uh, and the the uh, ability of this uh, country and nation to stick together uh, and be able to pass it on to the, our next children to leave uh, a a critical mass to the next generation so you know an issue of border, security is not just an economic issue. There'll be some aspects that are, that are, you know, go to economics of it, but uh, we are trying to make sure that we know, you know, a sovereign country needs to be able to secure its borders and have a say as to whether bringing in people to it and a particular type of people goes to whether it's good for the country. So, you know, immigration is obviously front and center, ending endless wars, refining commitments overseas, and yet doing it not from a libertarian perspective, but doing it from a strength perspective, um, trying to make sure that uh, from a traditionalist standpoint or social conservative, typically old school social conservatives, that we are taking those issues seriously. Um, so something like a transgender moment is something that we would be very uh, active on. Uh, big tech reform is an America first perspective because it gets at to, you know, are we dealing with the concentrated powers that are impacting the American people? Um, so those are the the issues that I think are are dominant out there. Obviously, trade. I mean, not being uh, maximalist from the standpoint of how a particular uh, trade arrangement is is impacting a community. Do we have healthy communities? You know, we're not just consumers. So you know, are how are we as a community, as as fathers, as neighbors, as employers? Is drugs ran, running rampant? You know, what's how are people living their lives? And then I think the component that 
I think needs a little more development is something we've lost for 50, 60 years, which is much of what has animated our policy development is that, you know, to some extent, we're, we're all materialists now. And that's not a good thing. Uh, that we as human beings are made with souls for a purpose and that to the extent that our policy doesn't allow us to have that debate, then we're always going to be lacking uh, and, 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 and unsatisfied. And this is a point that Whitaker Chamber made, you know, 60 years ago. And so uh, that's something that I think the conservative movement needs to, to continually uh, grapple with. But that's my conception of America first, I think it's very aligned with where the 2015, 2016 corrective was. Uh, but I think that uh, pulling on all of those threads to see the implications uh, will take a long time. How do you see that agenda as differing from the Tea Party wave and that movement that came in the 2010s, uh, early 2010s, uh, late 2000s? Um, you were intimately involved mm -hmm. in all of that through what you were doing at Heritage Action. Um, you know, in my mind, there's some there's some obvious breaks from that agenda that America First implies. Um, what are those for you? And and sort of how did you how did you think about that approach? Have you always had those sympathies to begin with, or or, or you know how how did you make that transition um, as this new movement came about? Uh, great question. You know, I the the people are generally and often similar people. The Tea Party activists is the same America First act activists, not always the same. There's many new people under the part of the process. But um, I think the Tea Party moment was the first awakening that something is really off. And you had a massive expansion of government, which I think is an America First issue. I'm happy to drill down on that a little bit more. But it was the first time that people said, this is a massive problem. They, I have the same mortgage situation. I'm paying my mortgage. You're not. You just foreclosed. You ruined our neighborhood, and we're going to bail you out. So it was. It was a. It was a the first corrective, but it it took us a while, I think, to deduce as a movement what were the most important issues facing the country at the time. So. At, you know, we were starting to get our handle around on um, immigration. Um, Bush was pushing amnesty. Uh, that had always been something that the movement um, uh, was fighting. But it took us a long time to say front and center. What if we were to design a policy agenda based on what's on America people's American people's mind and the most critical issues to the country? What would those be? And I think right now um, the America First Corrective has given us a better shot at deducing that what we're fighting on is what is the number one fight. Um, and I, you know, I took a look at an issue like uh, corporate welfare, which I think is a very important issue. Um, was that the particular fight that we should have fought and rallied the entire country to? You only get a couple of things that you can rally the country to. Uh, and I think figuring out how to, 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 to do that uh, responsibly, I think is one of the correctives that we've, we've determined. When it comes to growth of government, um, fiscal responsibility, deficits, um, I think that there's a lot of people who who identify as America First conservatives who 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 see themselves as part of this new right that are a little bit less interested and in, in putting those issues front and center on our agenda, and then um, you know even more broadly sometimes see those issues as an or, or that framing or the prioritization as an impediment to other parts of our agenda one of the things that we heard all throughout the trump administration and still do is that the reason we can't regulate uh, big tech is because that's big government that's uh you know expansion of size and scope of government a do you agree with it, 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 do, where do you disagree or agree with the assessment that those issues are are, are maybe not fit to this moment? And, and B, how would you push back against people who say things like that? Yeah, I think that uh, it is, I believe that the big government, uh, the view that America first necessarily means big government is wrong. And I've, I've said that in, in kind of the, some of the justification for our new organization. Um, I, I view it as uh, there are things, Often the free market limited government can be a, a conversation stopper. And I think that's really the problem and where the reaction has been, where the tension has. On big tech, it, since why can't we use antitrust laws that are on the books for concentrated power? 
I understand that there's been 40 years of trying to get antitrust laws back in a box uh, that uh, many on the right were a part of, uh, Justice Scalia, Justice Bork, and I, that's great. That doesn't mean we don't have a real new threat that needs to be uh, thought through with regard to the tools in our toolbox. And to the extent that, you know, limited government is just a shield, uh, I think that's where the problem comes in. On spending, on big government, you know, I think there's this view that you, if, if you care about spending, and I do, I mean, it's my kryptonite, I hate spending taxpayer resources, that doesn't mean I don't want a big Navy. That doesn't mean I don't want a wall. That doesn't mean that uh, there aren't federal priorities that deserve federal resources that I'm excited about. Uh, and I think that the American people are excited about. And this notion that uh, you have to, it's either all or nothing, I think is is um, um, where you know f free market folks that are a little more libertarian that don't wanna have uh, a large, robust federal government would would take issue with, and those on the left that say, "Well, you're not consistent when it comes to defense spending, and so you don't get to participate either in the conversation about limited government." So, I, I think big government's an issue. I think if you have big government uh, expanding into people's lives and communities, um, it means they communities can't function well. You don't have healthy communities. Uh, you don't have people in in civic society stepping up to the forefront, and so. You know, I look at it from a, a little bit different angle about why I would care about it. I also think you, you can't expect the people that need to, to have frugality in their life to ha then have a, a federal government that is is the reverse. So, you know, in my mind, it's it's not uh, there's no it's not uh, a, a challenging question to figure out why the movement is rising up against Biden's you know four trillion and counting uh, spending plans. Uh, they're totally inconsistent with America first. So while we're taking libertarians to task and talking about <laughs> gently. Uh, <laughs> gently, you know, a, a slight rebuke um, and, and talking about building healthy communities and families, uh, I want to kind of back up to to, uh, you know, you touched on an issue, I guess, that's very near and dear to my heart talking about uh, consumerism and how kind of our like rampant you know, kind of like free markets, free people, like ideology on the right has has kind of created this society where we value consumption and what we see like on our screens over real like day to day life and real, you know, like meaningful, I guess, interaction with with the world around us. I I know that this probably falls a little out of your purview as like director of OMB, but like I've I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on like what should what should the conservative response be to to like the real conservative response to to rampant consumerism and like the 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 kind of prioritization of the 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 wrong things over family and community. Um, since you brought it up, I'm just curious to hear yeah, your thoughts. I, I, I'm very interested in it. I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we. Um, just assume that all is good in our house, right? And that we can just talk about freedom and that's the end of the story. And that is, you know, the highest aim. I love freedom. I think it's essential. It, it was also intended to sit on the, a moral framework of a, of a, you know, uh, a religious and moral uh, set of values that have largely uh, fallen away in a secularized society. And so now we have a situation, I've used the example of, you know, think about a carpenter who's building a second or a third uh, story on a house that's on fire. <laughs> uh, it, we would call that madness. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of where we are right now is that um, freedom is now licensed and autonomy in a way that I don't think the conservative movement has fully grappled with. Mm -hmm. And I think that those of us who are trying to say, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're not going to say we're we're against freedom. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying that we need to to dive deep into uh, what is uh, what are the, the the underpinnings of a, a moral and a, a religious community of people that can protect the nation, that can be the basis for our freedoms and pluralism, and, and all of those things are, are in a particular context and what makes people healthy is what we wanna be a part of having a mm -hmm. conversation about. And so, you know, we care about uh, things like marriage and we care about uh, things about like 
uh, how a community is functioning, uh, because the, all those gets to you know a free people and a free society, and whether we can not just enjoy our freedoms but do our duty, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I, I think I was you know thinking about it recently. It, it's it's when you think when someone's taking away your freedom, what are the things that most get you passionate about? It's when you can't do your duty. Those are the ones that are the most compelling for you to rise up and say, absolutely not. And I think that says something about how, you know, properly functioning liberty is supposed to exist. It's it's to live the right way and to do one's duty for not just the current generation, but to our past and to our future. Mm. So with the approach and mindset that that you've laid out here you've created a new organization called the Center for Renewing America and and another sister organization called Citizens for Renewing America um, very explicitly sort of what are the charge of those two organizations and how do you intend to take the approach that you've laid out here the way of thinking about politics and policy and 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 you know bring utility to the movement to implement it uh, both of them are charged with a, a, a regaining a consensus in this country about what it means to be America, that we're a nation under God, uh, that we have uh, certain interests as a people, as a country, uh, that flow from our people, our history, and our institutions, and that our enjoyment of freedom, as we just talked, is, it comes in the context of just laws and healthy communities. Uh, we want to take that to the policy development process and to make sure that these America First type issues uh, get fleshed out and developed and not turn the page on them. And similarly, we think that that needs to happen not just in DC, but in in grassroots uh, with building leaders who are dedicated and knowledgeable uh, in ordinary lives, uh, not unlike what you all are doing in your organization. And so uh, we will be successful as a movement when there are leaders all over the country who are performing statesmanship-like activities in their neighborhood in their business because and here's the issue you know they have particular people that they lead and so i can come and give a speech or you can come and give a speech but that's just not going to be the same as individual employer or individual father or individual church member saying here's what i think about critical race theory here's why it's bad and getting the tone exactly right not just the head knowledge, but the heart knowledge to be able to speak into a community and say, uh, I care about you and I think you're wrong on this and here's why. That is what I think is statesmanship at the grassroots level and we need more of it to make sure that people have both the urgency of the time is in, in your parlance, what time is it? <laughs> but at the same time, know uh, that we are dealing with human beings where we l- we need to love each other and we need to both speak truth and speak love at the same time. So I, I think grassroots activism is is never been more vital than right now. And it's not just calling your congressman. It's it's knowing the issues well enough and being uh, having the skill sets and the leadership capacities and then just going out there leading all of which doing it from the standpoint of um, a robust moral fa- fab- uh, fabric that you are actually a leader. Um, you are practicing, you know, what you're preaching, and I think that uh, holistic view of 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 a person is what we're trying to build in the grassroots. So, I I, I guess just walk me through the mechanics here. Um, uh, the term grassroots activism gets thrown around a lot. Some people think that's just tweeting. Um, you just mentioned calling your congressman. Obviously, that's another thing people think about. But but very tangibly, what What is the impact that an individual citizen can actually have on the process in D.C.? And and certainly not just, you know, individual citizens in concert, you know, 10,000 of them in a in a district or a thousand of them. Um, How does that actually work? You've been inside Congress. You've been inside a presidential administration. You've been in the nonprofit sector. You've sort of seen the gamut of how this works. Um, Does it matter? And, And it seems like you believe it does. How does it matter? It does. Every member of Congress is different. Uh, they all have a different center of gravity at the end of the day. What makes them fight or not fight? What makes them care or not care? What makes them p- change their position or not pos- change their position? And then all of them are different. They all have different interests. And you got to figure out what those interests are and try to help align their interests with the interests of the country. Hopefully, we all wish in a perfect world that would be a given. It's yeah. not always a given. 
And so figuring out how to align those two and then figuring out uh, how to be voices into their center of gravity and their supply lines. And, and I think that's uh, the approach that I've always brought to it, which is, um, you know, how do they make a decision? Who do they rely on and be a part of that conversation? And um, there are uh, at that point, you're looking for leaders in their district, in their community who have platforms uh, to to be a meaningful voice. And so that can be on Twitter. It can be on Facebook. Uh, but it also can just be uh, someone who has a big e- email list. It can also be someone who uh, is public, is a, is, has a lot of uh, uh, public exposure in their district. Uh, it, it could be a donor. It could be someone that's just a friend of a friend. I mean, put yourself in, in all of our decisions. When we formulate our views on a topic, who do we look to? Um, we typically look for someone who we trust, who we think is accurate. Uh, is going where we're going. And all of those things are trying to how we unpack building up leaders with big voices in a particular district and then figuring out how it can be used. And uh, we have found it to be very successful and that's what we're trying to build. No, it's it's exactly uh, from a different angle, the approach that we have. Um, you guys recognize that the grassroots and local leaders are part of that that horizon that a legislator or someone else in power, uh, you know, ha- takes input from. And we look at staff and when we realize that that down to the most junior level, the environment being created in a congressional office itself is extremely important. Um, what so, so you know, you've mentioned critical race theory a couple of times, and to me, that is, I think, the perfect example of an issue where what you're doing is so important, because I don't think people really understand yet what ex- exactly is going on, and, and I think that there's some problems with the term. I mean, it's just it's critical race theory. What does that mean? It's it's, it's a very academic term. That's where it comes from. Um, walk me through how it is that you guys are, are are working on educating the grassroots and working on educating policy leaders on that issue and, and how you, you came to recognize it as, as a civilizational crisis in, in the way that, that you do? Um, right now, there's probably no other issue except for voter integrity that is, is front and center on the minds of the American people, grassroots particularly. Uh, and and I'm seeing it constantly. I'm seeing people who see me on television and say, hey, you know, I'm not really that political, but I really care about what you're doing because I don't want my kid to go to school and be told that they're a racist uh, because of the color of their skin. Uh, and so this is not just a conservative movement issue. It has a lot of legs uh, as a result of the kind of the the force that the Biden administration is using on issues of equity. But just to back up to talk about what it is, uh, you know, 1843, Karl Marx says uh, we need to criticize the existence of everything. And uh, the point within Western civilization was criticized on such a level that it would cause a revolt of the elites and that the, all of society would begin to just stink. Uh, and that people would lose their commitment for preserving and conserving the 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 the, uh, the 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 civilization that we had, society that we have. And so, you know, fast forward over the next hundred years or so, you see in, in the left, uh, particularly in the universities, uh, the critical race theory, critical gender theory, uh, all of these things are f- flowing out of that strategic proposition that. Uh, we'll be able to pull down our institutions if everything begins to stink. Um, critical race theory basically says, look, we are not headed towards a colorblind society, that we are not headed towards um, the type of society that Martin Luther King articulated for, that you are judged by the content of your 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 character and not the color of your skin. Instead, um, it's a, it's a, it is criticizing that viewpoint in that it, you must be a colorblind, you must be a... a uh, a color-based society to be able to actually remove the equities that we see around them. Um, and this is on the left is, is comes from a view that, um, you know, when, when you don't deal with sin properly in your, your political theology, you see sin at, you know, it's, there has to be some excuse for why you see inequity or see bad things out in society. And so uh, that must be because the institutions that have been built up. Um, and so, 
your your then your strategic desire is to pull down those institutions or riot or or uh, deface uh, diners and 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 restaurants, and that's what we saw last year. And so, uh, this. I believe this philosophy is so uh, noxious because it's not just changing, uh, you know, our diversity training programs. It's impacting every institution in every community in the country and causing it's, it is given a reason to revolt and a re reason to have society pulled down uh, by the rafters. And I think we've got to reject it. Uh, and then also uh, be able to point to what has made our, our country great. Um, that we are all made, you know, created under God equal and, and given inalienable rights as a result. And that's the future. That's what we're trying to to uh, to affirm. So it's a lot there. Uh, but I think that this gets back to the strategic designs of the left. And they have some 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 years on on when they came about. So here's the other like really infuriating thing about critical race theory is that like not only is it being taught in public schools, but it's being taught in like Christian institutions as well. So like the the university that uh, I attended in Minnesota, um, you know, small private Christian college, like 3000 students, um, they're teaching critical race theory, like at this like, you know, purportedly conservative uh, Christian college. And I think the thing that's the most infuriating t to me is that it's like, it's dividing believers, but it's also teaching something that's that's antithetical to the Christian faith that, you know, uh, your your sin is innate, but there's also like nothing that you can do to fix it, um, which I think is like antithetical to the to the, you know, sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's like, you know, for those of us who are Christians, like that's what that's what we believe in. Um, and I think critical race theory is is completely uh, antithetical to that message and 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 to the beliefs that this country was was founded upon um so i guess my my kind of follow-up question uh you know to what you're saying is like how, how else you know aside from you know pulling funding for this out of out of schools and that sort of thing like how else can we fight back against this evil ideology i mean it like completely again like antithetical to the american idea how do we fight back yeah i think there's a uh a couple layers to the the problem that you just mentioned. Number one, uh, the most immediate is just Christians have a different. We, we have a split view. We do not have a consensus, unfortunately, that I think is the right consensus to say, uh, you know, that we can care about diversity and we can care about making sure that people are all uh, equal in in the sight of the law and their Creator. Uh, and that that does not mean that we're going to just latch on <laughs> to the, the latest thing that the left comes from. And I think sometimes there's a, you know, a lack of appreciation and um, a naivete that uh, just because, you know, uh, someone says they care about Black Lives Matter, that that doesn't come with an agenda. Or are you going to sign up for that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have made some progress in the last year with BLM being out there so forcefully to be able to unpack that for many believers. But I, we've got a lot of work to do. And, and in my own case, just me leading on critical race theory at the president's request uh, allowed many people to just take an account. OK, what's this all about? Like, wh what is Rust? What is Rust doing uh, in the context of my local church? And as a result, I think many people said, well, I'm 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 on his side uh, because I think he's made a good case. And now I kind of see what's going on with that that viewpoint. So I think short term. Um, it's people leading. And what I mean by leading is speak and speak to your network of people, however you want to do that. That could be an op-ed, that could be a Facebook post, but naming what you're opposed to, why, and making the case for it um, and, and being smart about it. I think though there's a bigger issue uh, on within Christian circles and that's worldview. We don't, we no longer operate on the basis of worldview. So in my mind, you know, I'm going to uh, be voting Republican because from a worldview standpoint, because I'm tracing all these ideas back. And I know that, you know, the, the Biden administration, if you trace their world back, I don't I don't necessarily care about how he talks being more, you know, moderate sounding, because I, I trace his worldview back to how you view about human nature and what society is 
and these these critical issues like what's your view of God? What's your view of, of man? Is man the measure of all things? Is God the measure of all things? Fairly mm-hmm. basic worldview issues. And now Christians generally, particularly elite Christians, no longer think on that basis. They are looking for a third way and one that marries, I think, unbiblical ideas with things that they're locked in, like on pro-life and, 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 and gender issues. And that lack of worldview um, uh, conviction has caused them to go down all sorts of, of, of roads that just lack clarity at best and, and is just damaging at worst. Mm. Thinking about the critical race theory issue, um, kind of necessarily ask the question, you know, how have conservatives failed in the last 40 to 50 years? Um, education, I think, being one of the key ones. Um, you know, we spent the last 40 years or so with the primary focus of education reform being school choice. Um, and and what I can't help but think about is, is by putting the focus on private and charter options, we almost ignored the public schools or or we, we wanted them to almost tacitly get worse so that it was a better case for the private and charter options. And I think that that goes to a broader approach difference between uh, the new right and America first uh, than, than what came before is that these institutions exist and we have to fight where people are. Um, and I, I guess, how do you think about what the shortcomings of the movement and of our approach have been over the last 40 years and and how critical race theory may be a lens for that. Uh, I think that the problem we've had over 40 or 50 years, and it's one of the reasons that I'm most excited about uh, the organization that I've had the privilege to start, is that the issues that will get you disinvited from a dinner party are the issues that we have refused and run away from. And I, those are the cultural issues that which I define broadly. It's not just your traditional social conservative issues. But critical race theory would be something that we would never have touched with a 10 foot pole because that would have, you know, oh, my gosh, you, you know, you're you're messaging on that. What that 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 will that will cause all of our polling, you know, to be out of whack. And that's not who we want to project to soccer moms. And so and there's always been this implicit hope. I'm not sure it was a belief that if we didn't fight on it, the left would just stop uh, and they'll let us have our compromise, our treaty terms. But that's not the left. The left, these are stone cold Marxists. They're all trained Marxists. They're, there's a vanguard on their side that has been uh that knows what they're trying to accomplish with a particular purpose, and they're never going to stop. It's why the Democrats are so much more effective than the Republicans, because we have generally a happy to be here caucus that doesn't really understand the stakes of what we're fighting for. And they have none of their members that are watered down like that. And so, uh, you know, these are the issues that if we don't fight on, we lose our civilization. And I think we've awaken to that. I think the new right has helped us awaken to that. And so critical race theory has to be front and center. Transgender uh, contagion in our schools impacting our daughters uh, across the, the country needs to be a front and front center issue. Um, you know, so that's how I think we have failed over the last 40, 50 years is we thought that if we just dealt with the government in our life and limit it, that that would take care of culture and that if you know culture is downstream, but when you have an entire uh, side of the country that's attacking the mores of our foundation and in favor of secularism, you're never going to have an opportunity to to get culture back. And so now we've we've got to use the levers that we have, including government, to get culture back as best we possibly can. What are some of the things that you're really excited about at Center for Renewing America and Citizens for Renewing America in the coming? weeks, months, and years? And, and how can people get involved if they'd like to and learn more? Uh, well, we just brought on uh, a real top scholar, Adam Candub, to work on big tech reform. Um, he was cited in Clarence Thomas's um, you know landmark opinion recently. So I think he will do a fantastic job with other allies like Rachel Bovard uh, to be able to really articulate what are we trying to accomplish and win the, the day. Uh, that is something that, you know, there is still, you know, if the president's call, tr- President Trump's calling to a Republican say, are you opposed to 230? Yes, they'll probably be supportive of, of that reform. 
But when it comes to actually doing it, is there intellectual conviction yet? No, there's not. And so we really need to change opinions and, and win the case that you can be for big tech reform and still be a limited government, free market, uh, principled uh, member of Congress. Um, we're going to continue to fight on the, the, the infrastructure bill that the Biden administration, this is just not infrastructure. And I think since we've been talking America first, um, you know, the left's going to use things that uh, sound good to our constituencies to mask their big government proposals. <laughs> Everyone wants good roads and bridges. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and if that was what we had in front of us, um, which the Republican pr plan put forward, um, you know, that would be a fundamentally different conversation. But to the extent that you're using the term infrastructure to bless um, a grant program that blows open uh, neighborhoods and single family, single family housing, uh, that's going to be the type of thing that we have strong issues with. Uh, so we'll continue to work on that. Um, and then what I'm really hoping to do is really begin to expand on what we do in getting us out of endless wars uh, and refine and and uh, reassess our overseas commitment, uh, because I think that's one of the biggest needs in this town. Uh, there are very few organizations that are are bought into that approach, and we want to be a place that does that. Yeah, no, that we're, we're very much sympathetic on that. In fact, I was just having a conversation with with someone um, who'll be on the podcast soon uh, about what a wasteland it is, even on the conservative side in D.C., if you are in favor of actually restraining uh, and reprioritizing our military presence abroad. You have very few friends in Washington. The neoconservatives and the hawks are very, very good at completely flooding the zone at every major institution in D.C. Um, and there's all sorts of names that get trotted out if you if you break from the party line on that. Oh, you're an isolationist or you're an anti-Semite or X, Y, Z. It's just ridiculous. Um, that's that's a great set of priorities to be focusing on. Um, and uh, it, what are what are the handles on socials and what's the website and, and how can people learn more, Russ? Uh, AmericaRenewing.com. Uh, am uh, Renew Center at or at Am Renew Center, and um, uh, we also have uh, Citizens Renewing America dot com as well. That's fantastic. Well, please, um, you know, be sure to check it out, and uh, thank you for coming on the podcast, Russ. Thanks for having me, guys. Keeping in theme with the conversation we had with Russ about organizing at the grassroots level, I wanted to bring attention not only to a particular article, but also more broadly a series of articles and an author that I've learned a lot from over the last couple of months. His name is David Hines, and he's been writing a column for the American Conservative magazine, which we obviously adore here at American Moment, um, all about organizing and activism, uh, sort of at a theoretical and conceptual level. Uh, uh, and where the right tends to fall short. And one of the best articles he's written on this topic is, is very plainly titled, How the Right Can Organize Like the Left. Um, and there's a central insight that he talks about in that piece, along with others, that I wanted to really drill down on, which is, um, I'm sorry, there's no marketplace of ideas. It's not real. It's fake. You were led to believe that something is real that isn't. And I don't want to over extrapolate what that means, but the insight that David and, and I are getting at when we when we talk about that is that good ideas alone cannot save the day, that you need to have people who understand how institutions of influence and power work, how to manipulate them towards your end, and how to have the right people in them in order to bring ideas across the finish line. Um, I highly recommend that you check out um, uh, David's entire series because it'll give you an idea as to uh, the fundamental poverty of the way that the right tends to think about power and how, especially when it comes to implementing a realigned agenda for the right, uh, it's extremely important that we rethink some of our approaches on these issues and realize that good ideas are important, but there's a lot of layers to that pie that matter a lot more. Yeah. And the the piece that I'd really like to highlight this week is actually uh, another substack. I know I'm, I'm, you know, pretty heavy on, uh, recommending these sub stacks but uh this nick, nick would like to bankrupt every publication he just wants it all to be sub stacks <laughs> yeah everyone should should just start a sub stack yeah. um yeah we 
I should look into that. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, this this uh, particular issue by uh, Richard Hanania uh, is called, quite frankly, why is everything liberal? Um, and and kind of the thesis for his whole piece is centered around this, uh, you know, kind of helpful diagram that's been going around on Twitter for the last couple of weeks uh, about, you know, where most donors uh, come from, both like to political parties from uh, organizations and also employees. And, and you know, we'll we'll have a link to this in the in the description. But if you look at this graph, it's like there are like three. Yeah, three imp- like professions uh, that give more to Republicans than to Democrats. And uh, it looks like everything else is uh, it's Democrats all the way down. Uh, so the interesting thing that Richard talks about in this piece and, and, and kind of similar to Sraab's, honestly, is, uh, you know, it's a it's a lack of organizing and, 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 and a lack of, um, you know, effort on the right's part uh, to actually motivate people um, and move beyond the non-existent marketplace of ideas. Um, so highly recommend you check this piece out, um, you know, very prescient considering, uh, you know, Russ's new organization. Um, so make sure you check out his stuff as well. Yeah, I think that another one of the things that that is touched on in both of these pieces is how there is a, a, for lack of a better term, a bureaucratic instinct that I think a lot of conservatives lack um, because so much of the, uh, you know, prevailing winds on the right over the last 30 to 40 years as, uh, you know, activists grew into leaders uh, focused on things like individual freedom uh, and individualism more broadly. That's not it's very hard to find collectively minded people who can organize inside institutions who are also radical individualists. It, it's it, the, the political telos that people operate off of has consequences for their ability to implement their own agenda. And so for those of us that are trying to implement a more common good oriented vision, a more nationalist vision, um, and a more communitarian vision more broadly for politics, we have a leg up provided that in the process of selecting new leaders, selecting new personnel, selecting people who will advance our agenda in every institution in American life, we select for people with that instinct, the sort of people who know how to be part of an institution and mold it and drive it towards their ends. That's something we're very focused on at American Moment. If you think that you're someone like that, please reach out to us because uh, we want to get you involved in a substantive and permanent way. There's not enough of us in politics and we need a lot more. Um, Thank you for listening to our podcast this week. Uh, Once again, make sure to rate and review five stars. And if you do, uh, we'll be sure to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Podcast at AmericanMoment.org if you don't want to write it in the review itself, but make sure to include a screenshot of your five-star review uh, and send any feedback that you may have for the podcast there as well. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.